This will take 15 seconds or less. I need your help in making a new video. I need you to tell me what you would do if you knew that life on Earth was coming to an end in 30 days. Please leave it in the comment section and I'll describe this whole thing in more detail after the video. Thank you. I'm going to do my best to give you all the details of this story, but you have to understand, the story which I'm about to tell you had happened some 30 years ago and some memories have been lost in time. I was 14 years old when this experience took place and my family and I we lived in a small town in one of the south central states. This one night, my friends and I were hanging out by the lake talking about this new girl in school. Mikey and Tom were completely infatuated with her and supposedly both of them were going to ask her out. So yeah, we were just laughing, arguing and generally having a good time. I remember telling Mikey that my money was on Tom and Tom of course agreed. But strangely enough, Mikey didn't protest my statement and this attention seemed to be elsewhere. He was looking at the sky and wouldn't say anything. A few seconds later, Mikey breaks his silence as he says, Guys, I think I just saw a plane crash. Both Tom and I went, Where? Where? Right over the marsh, I saw a fireball in the sky, then a flash of light, and then I think it landed in the marsh. Mikey answered. I told the guys, Let's go check it out. But then Mikey goes, Nah, my dad's gonna get pissed if I'm home late again tonight. Mikey left us a minute later, and the excitement kind of fizzled after that. Tom and I went home disappointed, but we soon forgot about the night. I think we sort of figured that Mikey was BSing about the plane crash, because not one of us brought it up after that. A week later, I saw Mr. Clark, who lives two houses down from my place, get rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. Apparently, Mr. Clark had developed a fever the previous night. Mrs. Clark woke up in the morning and she found him completely unresponsive to stimuli. That afternoon, mom wanted to go check on Mrs. Clark, but dad got really angry and told mom to stay away from the Clarks for the time being. In fact, he set me, my sister and brother on the couch, then told us that we are not to go near the Clarks. He made that very clear. I know it sounds really cold, but my dad was just looking out for us. And thank God for that too because the next day, we saw Mrs. Clark get taken on an ambulance as well. Her daughter Lena was taken in the same ambulance. She could still walk and talk, but you could tell something wasn't right with her. On the very next day after that, everyone in town began to get sick. I heard the nurses came down with the same thing first, and Dr. Langdon was the only medical professional left in town. He must have called the Centers for Disease Control before he succumbed to the illness because we had choppers landing and army trucks riding into town on the same day. The army guys were wearing masks that covered their entire cranium. On the other hand, doctors and scientists looking people were wearing full hazmat suit looking things. They had the town surrounded in no time and the main road which connected the town to the outside world was blocked off as well. They told us to go home and stay inside. They said they would check for the ill in each house from next morning. We were not to go outside under any circumstances. We had four individuals come to our house the next day. From what I could see, it was a group comprised of one doctor and three soldiers. It was easy to tell since the soldiers were wearing army uniform and they were carrying military spec rifles. The doctor asked us several questions, took our blood sample, and left us after about 20 minutes. They sprayed something on the door as they were leaving, but I didn't know what they wrote at the time because we weren't allowed to go outside. That day, we looked out from the window pretty much all day. We saw some of our neighbors get taken in some army truck, and some were locked in inside their homes just like us. That night, we heard the sound of a truck coming down on the street. It stopped in front of the still occupied houses, then a soldier got out from the back and dropped off something on the porch. When it was our turn, we heard a knock on the door. By the time we opened the door, the soldier had already jumped back on the truck. There was a package right in front of the door, and the note was slapped on top of it. It read, Water and MRE. 
take it inside and stay inside. We did as it was instructed on the note. I remember getting really excited about trying army rations. And you know what? They actually tasted pretty good. About a week went by like that, and I could tell that on our street, there were only three homes still occupied with living, breathing human beings. It was getting really scary, and we were beginning to wonder if the army was just waiting for us to die. I'm sure you're curious about the landline, and yeah, they were disconnected. The army disconnected it on the same day they had arrived. By that point, we hadn't had contact with the outside world for an entire week. I don't know how they did it, but we weren't getting any radio or TV reception either. I mean, sometimes we could pick up heavily distorted sounds and images, but that was the extent of it, really. Then, in the morning of day 9, a black sedan pulled into our driveway, and out came three individuals from the car. They knocked on the door, came inside the house, then asked our parents to send the children upstairs. So we were sent up right away and didn't get to hear what the conversation was all about. An hour later, mom came upstairs with a backpack and told us to pack the things that were most important to us. She said she would take care of our clothes and other essentials. She made it clear that our stuff had to fit in the backpack and to be selective with what we take because we were never coming home again. Mom had tears in her eyes, she apologized to us, but stressed that we didn't have much time. We left home that day and just like she said, we never went back there again. The lady who handled our case had us stay in a hotel for a few days, then they took us to some type of government installation. We were given new identities there, and as well as a complete set of made-up life stories to tell our future friends and neighbors. Our whole family were trained and tested to essentially wear our new identities like second skin. It took us about three months to fully become new people, in a manner of speaking. Like say, if someone asks my name, I would naturally answer them with my new name and not my original one. I wouldn't need the split of a second to think of telling a lie. No, at that point, I became the new me. So then by that time, we were ready to live a new life and a new life was given to us. They gave us a house in a good neighborhood, two used cars in decent shape, and even a family dog to accompany us. Dad worked in a company assigned by the handler lady. Mom stayed home as she did before the whole thing went down. And you know what? Surprisingly enough, life went back to normal after that. It was only when I got older that I became really interested in finding out exactly what had happened to our old town. What's really surprising is the fact that there were hardly any mention of the event in the news. 1,000 people have vanished in less than two weeks, but they were somehow able to contain the whole thing so quietly. Before my dad passed away, I asked him if he can honestly tell me what had truly happened to us on that fateful day. He first told me to never repeat the names of the people he would mention and also the corporation that was involved in the matter. He sat me down and spoke to me for two hours, but here I'll give you a condensed version of it. A plane crash did happen on the night Mikey had mentioned about seeing a fireball in the sky. A plane had crashed in the marsh a few miles from our place and it was carrying some type of experimental chemical. Mr. Clark, along with few other individuals, worked in a factory near the marsh. They were the first one to come in contact with the chemical and therefore the first one to get sick from it. Out of the 1,000 inhabitants in our town, apparently less than 100 had survived the event. The survivors were given a choice to either sign a non-disclosure agreement for full financial support going forward or we could choose to speak about it and go through lawsuits after lawsuits against the giant corporation. My parents chose to cooperate. They had me, my sister, and brother to look after. The alternative wouldn't have given us much of a future. We don't know what happened to the rest of the survivors. We were split up when we left town, given new identities, then put in a new town hundreds of miles away from our old one. I have no clue what happened to Mikey and Tom. I don't even know if they are alive. I'm guessing some folks might have refused to sign the non-disclosure pact. But since I haven't found a single shred of evidence of anyone speaking up about that day, 
I leave it up to your imagination as to what might have happened to them. In the present day, my mom still lives and my siblings are doing well as well. As for me, I've got my own family, a lovely wife and two beautiful daughters. But sadly, they don't even know my real name and they never will. My dad worked for 22 years before he retired. Two days before he passed away, he made a confession to me and stressed that it was only for my ears. He told me that the company responsible for killing all our friends and neighbors was the company that he had worked for for those 22 years after taking on the new identity. He said that the guilt of staying mum ate him up from the inside throughout the years. He asked for my forgiveness for telling me the truth. He begged me to not tell anyone about it. He said that the weight of the secret would crush them as well. I think he became weak as he got older. He knew he was close to dying and he wanted to tell someone about his sins, but there was no one to tell it to. I was the oldest and they depended on me the most throughout his life. So he shed the weight onto me before he passed away and I was left to deal with the truth as best as I could. I'm prepared to sin as my father had before me. But the difference is, I'm going to take this to my grave and I will not pass it down to my daughters. I mention no names or the corporation involved in this event. I try to be as vague as I could with the details so there couldn't be any conjecture. Look at it this way. My father had me to shed the weight of his conscience. And I'm using you to at least talk about it once before I die. I've long moved on and because I've now got a future through my children, I often feel thankful of the life I live. However, there are days when I wake up to a brutally honest morning and feel tormented at the thought of how messed up this world is in reality. I don't know man, I've lived a lie for so long. The line between truth and falsehood had been blurred long ago. In the grand scheme of things, I don't think what I do really matters. I'm just going to continue living my simple life and keep my mouth shut till the last breath I take. First off, to tell you this story, I have to describe to you the sort of town I live in. It's not a big town by any measure, but it's always busy with lots of people around. The biggest reason for that is the college nearby, but there's also the fact that most of the residential buildings are apartments and there are only a handful of single detached dwellings. So I was coming home from work this one night. It was around 7pm and I had just gotten off the bus. My apartment's three blocks away from the bus stop and the walk home had always been pleasant. By that, I mean that the town is safe and there are always lots of people around, which makes you feel even safer. On the night in question, I was walking toward home like any other day, but I was going to drop by the sushi place to order a takeout. I walked about a block from the bus station and was right in front of the sushi restaurant. I was about to reach for the door when a really loud bass sound filled the entire town and the lights went out a second or two thereafter. It was completely dark and I also think that the ground shook a little, like a mini quake. Anyhow, you could hear people panicking all around you, but you really couldn't see anything. I took out the phone from my handbag, but the press on the fingerprint scanner refused to work. So I tried rebooting the phone, but nothing. It seemed like no one could turn on their phone because I didn't see a single screen coming on. Before that night, I had no idea how dark the night really is. Working and living in a city, I always figured the moon was quite bright on its own. But as it turns out, most of the lights we see in our apartments come from the artificial ambient lights and not the moon. So it goes without saying the streets were pitch black. I spoke to a few strangers on the street. I think we all tried to comfort each other and sure enough, it felt a lot better than standing around alone in the dark on my own. After about 10 minutes, our eyes adjusted to the darkness and we could all see much better. There were some businesses that had candles lit and that seemed to put people much more at ease. I said bye to the strangers I was talking to and walked home after that. The rest of the night was as mundane as any other power outage I had experienced. I went to bed a little early, then woke up in the morning without any problem. On the same day but in the afternoon, 
I took my phone to a tiny computer repair shop down the street from my place of work. I remembered seeing a sign that read, we repair phones, and so I figured it was as good a place as any to get my phone working again. I went inside the shop and the gentleman there told me to come back after work. I clocked out at 6 and went straight to the repair shop. There, the gentleman told me that my phone had been completely fried. Yeah, those are the exact words he spoke. Your phone had been fried. He told me that the inner components of the phone looked as though they were cooked inside a microwave. He asked me what exactly I had done to the phone and so I told him of the events from the previous night. After hearing my story, he said, There you go, it was the aliens. You're gonna have to get your money back from them because it'll cost you more money to repair that thing than buying a new one. The joke was kinda cringy and so I put on a fake smile, paid him 10 bucks, then left the store. When I went home that night, most of the town was still in the dark. I got off the bus then spoke to a few people who were standing in front of a coffee shop. As it turns out, they were already talking about their phones and how they were all fried. It looked as though everyone in town had the same story to tell. We made jokes about it and we laughed like it wasn't a big deal, but I could tell we were all still shaken from the experience. In any event, it took nearly two weeks for the entire town to get the power back on. During those two weeks, you could see a bunch of trucks from the electric company all around town. Whatever the damage was, quite simply, it was a lot. When the power came back on in my apartment, I also learned that my laptop, tablet, and TV had suffered the same fate as my phone. The only electronics that were still in working condition were simple machines like the toaster I had inherited from my mom and the light fixtures I had purchased from Amazon. I know this isn't the typical scary story you might receive from your viewers, but for me, it was the scariest thing I had ever experienced. What scares me is the mystery behind the event the loud bass sound which kickstarted the whole thing, the electronics getting fried, not getting any answers from the authorities, and finally there being something out there that can take us back to the stone age in an instance. That to me is the most terrifying thing of all. Right from the get-go, I gotta let you know, I actually have no idea what I'm talking about here. Allow me to elaborate. I think we all have those experiences where we know what we saw or heard, but we can't explain exactly what it is, if that makes any sense to you. What I saw in a business meeting two weeks ago was so weird and unusual that I have no similar prior experiences to make comparison to it. With that explained, here's what happened on that day. I work as a freelancer and I do data analysis for medium and large corporations. I'm constantly in business meetings throughout the week and two weeks ago was no different. On that day, I had a meeting set up in the afternoon with a company that is heavily involved in government contracts. I was very happy about the meeting because there was some good money to be made in that potential partnership. I arrived in their headquarters, checked in at the lobby and one thing that I noticed is how immaculate the facility was. I think it'd be an injustice to say that the place was clean. I believe it's only fair to say that the place was perfect. In fact, so perfect that it felt a bit unnerving. I would have probably needed a magnifying glass to find a single speck of dust. And the people? Wow, just wow. How do you train people like that? They all walked like models, dressed up so professionally. And they all had that magazine cover smiles on their faces. It felt as though I had just walked into the twilight zone. So yeah, I was escorted into an office by a woman who by anyone's beauty standard should be modeling professionally. I sat in that perfect conference hall waiting for the director of operation to arrive and he promptly did with two other individuals. We sat there discussing the details of the contract they were offering. The meeting was going well and I thought I closed the deal on the same day. We were about to discuss the final terms of their proposal when for no apparent reason, all three of them stopped talking. Actually, I have to be more specific. All three of them in the middle of a conversation ceased all movements. 
it was as though they turned into a statue or like a robot that stopped functioning. I went, uh, gentlemen, hello, is uh, everything okay? Did I say something? Excuse me, but I got nothing from them. There was no reaction at all. It took no less than a minute for them to continue talking and I'm saying they picked up the conversation from where they left off as if there was nothing strange about them freezing up and not saying anything for over a minute. How crazy is that? What made it even more insane is how all three of them woke up at the same time. And I use the word wake because that's exactly how they looked. It was as if I was talking to three robots when suddenly they went into sleep mode. Then they woke up again without any warning. I was thinking of all kinds of things at the time and the contract was the last thing on my mind. Look at it this way, I just really wanted to get out of there. What I did was to act as naturally as I could. I then made some demands that I knew they couldn't oblige that, in turn, assured that the contract would go to someone else. The meeting ended, I got my ass out of there, and I don't intend to meet those people ever again. So yeah, that happened, and I don't know what it was. It's strange and crazy, but that's all I can say about the whole thing. I don't mind that at all if you don't publish my story. But I wanted to ask, have you ever heard of something like this? And if you have, do you think you can explain to me what it is exactly that I experienced on that day? Hey guys, Dennis here. So I'm going to make a new type of video with your ideas and stories, and here's the scenario. Let's say that there's a gamma ray burst headed toward Earth. And by the way, it doesn't matter how the end is accomplished. I'm only giving you a scenario to help with the understanding of things. But yeah, when it makes contact, it'll mean the end of life on our planet. I know, I know, it isn't the most Christmassy thing to ask, but hey, look where you are, what do you think this channel is all about? So here are some of the final details of the apocalypse. Let's assume that the human race for the most part will stay civil. There's not going to be a mass calling or psychos running loose everywhere. Let's say that for the most part, people will try to spend their last days in as dignified fashion as possible. Some people will party 24-7, some will try to tick off their bucket list, and I think some people will try to cope with the inevitable by not changing anything, meaning they'll continue to go to work, clean their houses, mow the lawn, and so on and so forth. With that said, let's just say that for the most of the 30 days left, we'll still have basic utilities such as power, water, and sewage still functioning normally. Those are the baselines for the next 30 days until the apocalypse. Now, I need you to tell me what you would do in the next 30 days before the gamma ray scorches the earth into a giant fireball. <laughs> Merry Christmas, guys. <laughs> or happy holidays if you don't celebrate Christmas. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you on the next one. Goodbye for now.